If you hate Monday, that's bad. You can't hate Monday, everyone. You should learn how to get comfortable with discomfort, but that's different than hate. Don't get entitled to be like, ah, 25 minute commute, this blows, that's some bullshit. I'm talking about you're anxious because your boss is a piece of shit. You can't hate Monday. Attention is the number one asset. Hi everybody. We are here today for the open Q&A with Gary, the best fireside really of the residency. All right, who's gonna be first? That was actually so coincident because I didn't think I was gonna be the first person to go. But uh, um, it's nice to meet you, Gary. My name is Jacob Jesma. I'm one of the PCS residents. Um, so I have two questions. My first question would be, as a, the CEO, um, what, what was that sparking point for like, I'm gonna create a residency program that's like this incubator for younger professionals that are really gonna, even if we don't continue with the program, we're taking away so many things from the program. So like, what was that thought process was like, I'm gonna be the person who like builds this. That's a great question, brother, thank you. Um, it was a really clear vision of selfless, selfish behavior, meaning, a lot of times as a businessman, kind of the way I like to roll, like, and a lot of you probably have a good sense that I produce a lot of content and I'm out there, like, I really like the giving part of my life along with the entrepreneur. I'm a very, like, extreme juxtaposition of, like, opposite energy. Like, I love being an entrepreneur and a capitalist and I wanna win and all that stuff, but I'm infatuated with giving back and doing right things. Most of my charitable work and nonprofit boards, I keep pretty quiet. And then I try to mix that energy into my day to day. So as you know, Jacob, to your call, and I'm like very impressed and grateful that even the way you asked it, all of you now get to put Vayner Media in your LinkedIn, regardless if you're here or you're not after this, and I know already, because I've talked to a lot of people that have gone through this program, it just gets people jobs. And so we're paying to train you. Mm -hmm. right? Like real talk. So it's like a real fucking like winning move for a lot of people. Obviously on the flip side, I also want to hire as many people from this as possible. Or we'll hire as many as we can right now, but like some of you are destined to get an email from us in seven months even if you don't continue with us tomorrow, like right after, that's cool. Plus some of you will meet each other. So just like, it's a lot of good. And my brain's always thinking about like one plus one equals 11. Like what can I do that's good for everyone? That's why I think all of you that have been able to capture without knowing, you know, obviously if you're fully remote in the middle of nowhere, you're not gonna be able to feel the culture even through Zoom. You can feel it to some degree, but not all the way. But the ones that have really, whether through Zoom or physically, have been able to feel it, there's a reason that people like are happier at this company than other companies. Of course, amongst 2,000 people, there's people that are unhappy, the serendipity of the wrong boss, the wrong account, a million things can go into it. But when I think about the net, net happiness and retention of this company, we're out of control, good for Adland, and I'm proud of that, and I think the only way that happens is intent, and to your point, Jacob, the way this happened was intent. How do I put on more young people that have no way to get into this industry other than this program, and then our company's so hot that the second this is on their resume, they're good. Like, they're good if they put in the work to get out there. If And then more importantly, or not more importantly, but equally importantly for me is, hopefully every time we do these things, ironically, full disclosure, this is not one of those times. There's been times where we were able to hire most of the residents. That was a different time. That's when, you know, now we're not in that full place, but obviously, you know, I know there's gonna be people that go through this, go work in the industry for five years, and then reapply in five years to Vayner, and it's gonna be like super fun for us to be like, oh shit. They were in the fucking residency, pro like, you know, so I'm excited about that. So I'm just hoping to make it a win-win for everyone. And in general, that's how I think about business ideas. Awesome, okay, thank you. And then my, my second question, um, now that we only have, not only, but now that we have four weeks left, um, I guess it's gonna be very important for us to continue networking with people. Um, but I'll be very blunt, I would say that I struggle when it like ha comes to having those one-on-one -on -one connection with people where it's not where we're just having conversations about work. Um, so how would you suggest, like, as, again, young professionals yeah. here at Vayner or not at Vayner, how are we gonna build those connections and relationships with people? By talking about shit that you like. Cool, okay. So, like, let me break that down for you. There's a reason we have Slack 
and we have tons of channels with different stuff. To your point, it might be difficult for you have that combo, but you might be able to go into some of our general chats and just talk about the game last night or the restaurant you went to. People network through interests, not just through work realities, right? So, I mean, look, there's also something called like breaking through with things that aren't comfortable. So let's think that through, right? You know, to Sarah's point, as you can see, she talks about she's been working for 25 years and that's hard for her too. Let me tell you something that's hard for me, Jacob. Working mm-hmm. out and eating well. Yeah, that, that is, as someone who goes to the gym every day, it's, it's very hard, especially the eating part. Yeah, so for me, I could, you know, you're a young man, but I can tell you at 38, I had never put a muscle in my body and never ate properly in my life. And so this morning when I worked out and woke up at 6.45, even though I worked until midnight last night, that wasn't easy, but I did it. And so, you know, when someone says, hey, I struggle with networking. Well, if you value networking and you understand networking is valuable, I'm aware you may be introverted. I'm aware that it might come easier for Fernando C than you, or it may not. People are different, but just because people are different doesn't mean certain things aren't valuable, and it doesn't mean that people aren't capable to do things that don't feel comfortable or come easy to them. I don't work okay. out and eat better now for the last 10 years for kicks and giggles or because I like it. I fucking hate it. 10 years later, I hate it but I do it. And so there's also a little bit of that element of real life, which is, you, it may not come easy to you, but if you think it's important, you may have to learn how to get uncomfortable. And I will tell you right now, one of the biggest issues in the world, and not for Gen Z, for boomers, for anybody who's 100, and for anyone who's one, one of the great issues in society right now is people aren't breaking through and getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. We got real soft out here. Mm. So some, also another way to think about what I just said. But everything works. Life is life. Like it's gonna be what it's gonna be. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, but, but I think finding a way to make networking easy for you and everyone here, I always think that's around common interests. And tactics. I tell everybody, now we're a little bit in a virtual world, but I always told people, and anyone for these next four weeks that are in any of these offices, Live in the cafeteria and just say hi. This is a nice place. Most people don't network well because they're scared of rejection, right? They're scared of being blown off, that they're insecure. But this is a nice place, like people are nice here. So saying hi is like a fruitful concept. Thank you so much for definitely putting me on there. Um, And I guess the rest of us, uh, I'll definitely pass the question on to the next person, but it was great to, I guess, officially meet you. Pleasure, my friend. Uh, My name is Marisha. I'm a PCS resident as well. So nice to meet you, Gary. I'm currently reading your book, 12 and a Half. I'm not super fast into it, but the first chapter really shocked me. The chapter about gratitude, honestly, the stats were really humbling and low-key depressing, but really good for my perspective. I want to go to a quote. You said, when you develop perspective, the timelines you set for your goals naturally shift. And I'm currently in a kind of career transition. I'm 30. So I'm coming from customer service and doing things that are very different from what I'm doing here at Vayner. And I've been struggling to kind of get into that mind frame that I am kind of starting at the Mm. beginning. And I don't need to know everything immediately. And that's really hard for me because I know this isn't like anybody else, but I really like to do things that I'm good at. And (laughs) to kind of get better at things is really hard a hard pill to swallow so i was wondering if you could speak to kind of the grace that we can show ourselves as we enter into new phases in our lives and try new things so i love you for this question i um i think it's i think first of all your wordsmithing of everything that you just asked was extremely strong and um i really 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 took note of that so you should know that you're incredibly articulate uh thank you Look, grace to oneself is probably the thing I think about the most subconsciously. I talk so much about not beating up yourself. Like, this just becomes, the relationship you have with yourself is literally the whole game. And so, my question is actually the reverse. What's the alternative and why would you not show yourself grace? So it's really funny. 
you know, when you just gave your context, I'm like, ah, makes sense, right? You're hanging out with all these 23 year olds, even though you look 18, by the way, you really shook me with your 30. <laughs> uh, I was like, is she in high school? Uh, uh, I, uh, so look, I view this as very practical. I don't understand why you would beat yourself up. I'm not sure why one wouldn't want to give themselves grace. The rest of the world is shitting on you at all times. Why not be kind to yourself? Don't join in, right? And, and really I think what works for me, and I think this is gonna be the biggest question you need to ask yourself is how much do you value outside validation and from whom? You know, I think it's really easy to give yourself grace once you don't give a fuck what people think about you, including your parents and siblings and plus ones. It gets really easy. It gets real easy. So I think one's relationship with themselves, I think, is directly correlated to their relationship with other people's opinions. I admire my mother more than life. I think she's the single best human being on earth, and I give her an unbelievable amount of credit for everything that I am. Comma, I do not live my life based on her opinions or for her validation. And I think, yeah, I think I this that. is what you need to be thinking about. I'll give you a good one, team. When I tell you, if you're like selected to get a full-time offer versus not, I'm gonna say this very crystal clear to you. It is pure serendipity of a couple people's opinions. It is not a reflection that you're good or bad. If the God of good and bad came down after this process is done, I am sure that she would say to us, you were right about this person, but you were wrong about, like, it's just, that's how life works. You know what I mean? It's just serendipity, yeah. it's just serendipity. I think too many people have been trained by school and life to think there's a right way to do shit. There is no right way, there's life. Serendipity. Some people would be like, yo, this is the fucking best, and they get a full-time gig here, and, and they have a massive career, but guess what? You know what they don't know? Is that if they actually didn't get a job here, went to a different job, that they were gonna meet the love of their life in that job and they would have married a much better person for them there than if they would have stayed here. How about that shit? Life. Yeah, that's so good. I did wanna also <laughs> add <laughs> another question just to follow up with Jacob and his two questions. Between, I yo, from, between you and Jacob, I'm gonna be out of here and only two people are gonna fucking ask questions. But go ahead, go ahead. I'm joking, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Just one quick thing. I, I know you were born in Belarus, so I know your parents are also um, not American, yes. and my parents are also not American. So I was wondering, um, from an immigrant's perspective, yes. what you can speak to, especially when it comes to business and kind of like I was talking about having that pressure on yourself. Yeah, I, I think, look, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of immigrants on this call. I can tell visually, I'm making assumptions, but, you know, what immigrant kids know is like we have it different than. American kids, and not that it's better or, or worse, and there's plenty of immigrants that are very American in their style, and there's very many Americans that are immigrants. This is a general statement. It is different. We live for our parents more outside the U.S. than people in the U.S. do generally, and so, but at the same token, I had a mother, again, I'm an immigrant, that didn't do to me what most immigrant families did. She didn't say that school was the only way out. She didn't think that how I acted was a reflection on her. She had her own self-esteem. Like, so I got very fortunate. But what I would say to all the immigrants here is, you're gonna have to find that place that I just delivered earlier. You could admire and love your parents the most for what they've done for you and to set you up, but you cannot live for them. And the second you stop living for them and you live for your happiness, you actually deliver to your parents what they actually wanted all along was for you to be happy. They just think you being happy oftentimes is good grades, good schools, money, the right husband, wife. But when it's all said and done, they just want you to be happy. And the only way for you to be happy is to not listen to them. Not blindly. So good. Awesome. Since this is recording, I'll just go ahead and send this over to my parents. You got it. <laughs> you send them over to me. I got, I got, I got facts for them. I Thank got a couple so bucks. Thank you. Up next is Carlos. Hey Gary, my name is Carlos. I'm a media resident on New Era. So like Marisha said earlier, I'm in the same predicament where like, I know on your social medias you post about a lot, but like the 28 being the next, the new 21, you know, but it's hard to not think like, I, I gotta put the gas pedal on the, on the acceleration and like try to pick up my career cause this is actually my first step into this 
like industry. Yep. And, and like yourself, I'm a sports into like I love sports. Okay. So like I want to get into eventually work in sports. So that makes it even tougher because sports is competitive. Yep. Um, so yeah, that's my question. Like, what mentality approach would you take? And also, like, would you ever extend this program, some sort of this program, into your uh, Vayner Sports industry? With Vayner Sports, AJ really runs that shop, and I don't know if it's gonna ever get to the kind of scale that would allow this kind of program to go there. But I never say never. But at the end of the day, he's one A there, I'm one B, and so I can't necessarily speak to it. As far as the first part, look, I think this goes back to like being graceful to yourself. Like, what's the alternative? Couple things I wanna break down in the way you asked it. First of all, everyone, when I talk about patience, I do not talk about complacency. They're two different words. I am patient, but I'm obnoxiously ambitious, and I go hard every day. So it's a balanced thing, Carlos, you know what I mean? Look, I think perseverance and grit and all those things are gonna matter for you if you wanna break through, right? But you know, what's the mentality? The mentality is, you are young. Like, I don't know what else to tell you. Like, you can be mad at me, but like, you are. Are you as young as someone is 18? No, but I'm fucking 48 and I, and don't forget bro, real talk, I worked in a liquor store when I was 34. I love when kids roll up on me and being like, yo, I'm late. I'm like, late to what? I started this company, this company, in another company's conference room because I had no money. VaynerMedia started in Buddy Media's conference room for a year. And then we moved to Sunshine Suites down in DeBrosis, down in Tribeca, and I bartered that rent by giving him services and like trying to do stuff for the owner. We didn't pay rent the first two years, not because I'm crafty, because we didn't have money. And that was when I was 35 and 36, Carlos. So what the fuck do you think I'm gonna tell you? You know? All right, he said it like straightforward and blunt, which I <laughs> appreciate actually, because at the end of the day, I've been trying to, uh, like with this program, that's what I've been taking advantage of, like just pressing the gas pedal and just not caring what people think, but just after, like you want to think about also like what's after the program. Like you said, yeah, I'm of course. as a pitch to my next step. Hopefully, if I get if I'm, if, off, Carlos, if I'm you, you know I have juice and culture and sports. If I'm you, I just DM every single sports business on earth on LinkedIn and be like, yo, I just came from Vayner. I stole all the secrets. Hire me. Yeah. Awesome. Let's go to Andrew. The question's a little more broad, but if you hope that a Vayner employee, whether it's just like the residency, someone here for 10 weeks or someone here for like eight years, what is like the one thing you hope that they got out of it? That's a great question. That they contextualized that you don't have to work somewhere where you don't feel good. You know, my favorite thing about Vayner is it's shown people either in the beginning or when they're deeper in their career that there's a way to go hard but not be in an environment that makes you unhappy or anxious. I mean, that's the biggest thing Andrew, that I want. I think the other thing is we're very good at contemporary marketing. You know? Like, I want them to learn skills. A lot of people here learn skills. I'm very aware. I I very much believe that a lot of you will learn more in these 10 weeks than you learned in four years of college. Because this is real shit. Totally. And it's not only real shit, it's the real current shit. A lot of you have friends that work at other ad agencies that aren't learning real shit. They work at PR firms. The fuck? You know, so those are the things that stand out, brother. Awesome, thanks. Thank you. Next up, we have Alexandra. Hi, Gary. My name is Alex Berman, um, and I'm a PCS resident. Um, so, as I'm embarking upon my career journey, I would kind of love to know, um, like, some pieces of advice or words of wisdom that you wish, like, your younger self knew um, that you could kind of, like, tell your younger self. Um, from what you know now. Alex, I think it's a very individual thing. Everybody here needs to hear some different things. Like for me, it was that, if I took the 22 year old me, actually, I would say to him, bro, you're right about almost everything, but you have one huge piece of kryptonite and it's a flaw and it's gonna fuck you up and it's called your inability to be candorous to people because you like them too much. You're so gifted verbally and you're so capable of creating money in the future, you're gonna be able to get away with not being candorous-ish 
It's gonna work 95% of the time. The problem is the 5% of the time is gonna fuck you up personally and professionally. So you might as well fix it now because waiting to 45 like you're actually going to do to start getting better at it left you with 23 years of a lot of pain that you didn't need to have and all you had to do was be a little bit more courageous and understanding you're not Superman and you can't fix everyone and people have to learn their own lessons and there's a kind way to deliver that. That's what I needed, right Alex? I don't know what you need. You know, I think a lot of professionals, a lot of you in this call, what you really need is what I've been trying to lay down in the first 30 minutes. One, do not let any company or any person dictate to you your self-worth. Two, fight for scenarios that you like going to work. If you hate Monday, that's bad. Like, you can't hate Monday, everyone. Like, you can, you can for, like again, because this is where things are subtle, you should learn how to get comfortable with discomfort, but that's different than hate. Don't get entitled to be like, ah, 25 minute commute, this blows, that's some bullshit. <laughs> I'm talking about you're anxious because your boss is a piece of shit. You can't hate Monday. And really, Alex, like, real talk, work and life is a very simple game of self-esteem versus insecurity. I think people need to build their confidence at all costs. Thank you so much, that was so helpful. Alex, what do you think is like your biggest vulnerability potentially? Probably that I can be a perfectionist. So I'm always trying to do everything right all the time. Yeah, you've got, yeah, that's a good, yeah, like yeah. I'm my worst enemy. Yeah. I almost like want you to like do something wrong on purpose just to taste it. Alex, no bullshit. I make like 17 meaningful mistakes a day. The end. Like you gotta get comfortable with making mistakes. Otherwise you'll always be lower middle management. 100%. That just, so that's just fear, that's insecurity. Like perfectionist and people that say I'm a perfectionist or people say that they have imposter syndrome are just putting makeup on saying I'm insecure. So that's okay, we're all insecure. That goes back to like, were you over, like were you a good student? Yeah. Yeah, like you just got caught in that system where it's like, I, you know, and that's not real life. So start practice, right. start practice. Like external pressure. Correct, just start practicing now. Like, honestly, you've got to practice in like sending it in without your normal six more hours of fucking looking at it. Mm-hmm. You know? Yep. Thanks so much, Gary. You're I welcome. I really appreciate it. Of course. Next we have Melody. Hi, Gary. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm Melody. I'm a media buying resident on the Mondelez Growth Pod. Um, my question is a little bit different, but... I know you've been emphasizing the importance of social and being at the forefront of that. Yep. Um, so how do you think the social media landscape will change in the future? And what are some things that VaynerMedia is taking to continue to help their clients and brand stay relevant in the midst of it all? Melly, I'm not sure is the answer to your question. I think what we do better than anyone is we don't predict what's gonna happen. I didn't know TikTok and Musical.ly were coming, right? I didn't, you know, I didn't, know that stories as a feature was gonna become so important. I don't focus on knowing what's coming. I focus on moving very quickly when it came. And so what we do very well is we move very quickly once we think attention has shifted to a new platform or a new feature or a new medium. You know, I'm aware that VR is gonna come. Like I believe that every one of you are gonna market heavily in VR in your careers because you're all young including some of the 30 and 28 year olds on here. And so what we're best at is we move very quickly when we think something matters, like a TikTok in four or five years ago. And then we, because I'm a practitioner on it with my brand and my businesses, it allows us to scale the intellect and the best ways to use those things very quickly internally for such a big company like Vayner. And we're able to provide that insight and strategy and execution to our clients. Gotcha, thank you so much. Thank you. Cool, Diana. Hi Gary, I'm Diana. I am from Toronto. I'm a PCS resident, super excited. I just wanna first thank you so much for creating this program. It's been kind of revolutionary to just imagine like this new generation of advertisers who are coming. It's like pretty iconic and I'm super happy to be part of it. Thank you. And uh, also like 
having Canada as one of the newer offices that you opened, I have to tell you it's a gorgeous office and it makes me kind of think about what you were saying before in regards to how you started the first office with kind of like from scratch practically from no office to what you are creating right now. It's like, it's pretty crazy. I'm sure you probably have had many amazing ideas and probably have had people told you something in regards like um, not every idea is going to land or like sometimes you have to like kill your babies um, and now get to attach to your ideas. Yes. Is there a way that you go about it that makes it a little bit easier to not get attached to like your ideas and that kind of vibe? Um, by rec- yeah. By recognizing that humility is the single most important trait for a leader besides conviction and that if I get stuck on my own shit that the world of merit doesn't care about my feelings. I'm just completely detached because I don't get to choose. I don't have the insecurity or delusion to think that I get to vote. The reality of the situation is the vote. And so, you know, how do I get there? By knowing that if I don't, I'll be out of business. Yes, I like that. I also enjoy it because like, that kind of connects to some of the maybe thoughts in regards to like allowing other people to like listen to their perspective first and allowing them to give their perspective first and then you put your perspective second. But yeah, thank you so much. It's one quick question. I know that gratitude is also like really important to you. Any practices that you practice like on a daily basis for gratitude? Uh, I basically have a conversation every day of my life with myself in that I can't believe I'm lucky enough that here is another day that my parents, siblings, or children didn't die. Pretty much every day, Diana. And so I think I've gone to the ultimate state of gratitude. Because of that, I stress and I have anxiety like any human, but it's so different than most people. I just don't dwell on shit. You know, I can't sit on shit because whatever I'm upset about is so disproportionately secondary to what I just said to you. And I think that most of the people on this call right now take that part for granted. I'm not sure it's so healthy that I think, you know, it was really challenging as a kid because I thought about it my whole life. I'm not not sure it started in a healthy place, but I think it ended up in the healthiest place, which is really interesting. I believe that if I was a modern child, that my parents probably would have taken me to therapy because it was such a big thing in my life. I was petrified of my parents dying. Because both my parents lost a parent very young, I've come to realize. My mom lost her mom at five. My dad lost his dad at 15, 16. So it was just always in the air. And I think I internalized it. I love my mom so much. Um, And then later I got to spend more time with my dad and and I love him so much. And I, I think that it started off not healthy and ended up making me completely unstoppable. <laughs> uh, you know, it's pretty interesting to think about. Period. Thank you so much, Gary. Brandon. Hey, Gary. I'm Brandon Towns. I'm a PM resident of Kimberly Clark. I'm the person of Braxton. Uh, Matt Garcia is my SVP. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for coming to the Eden Van Noir event last month. I got together with Steph and Bree. It meant a lot. With that being said, uh, as the DEI is being beginning to disappear in many places in the industry, how are you ensuring Vayner is continuing to hold space for black and brown folks? By having dinners with Britt and talking to her every day to make sure it matters as much as making sure we make payroll. You know, that it, it is crazy, brother. It's, I, I care about DEI for only two reasons. One, because I do not understand how people don't understand that different perspectives. I mean, look at this screen. It's crazy, this is amazing. Like, people are gonna have different looks and different angles, it's just, it's good for business. And two, I also subconsciously got very lucky. You know, I grew up with so much diversity. I mean, I went to Martin Luther King Elementary School. I went to a 92% black college, so, I am black and Latino college. I got lucky in hindsight that it was just around me and I didn't even see the world any different. But just effort, my man, just effort, you know? The six hours that I've spent with Brit in the last two weeks on different things or six hours that most CEOs are spending on making money or, you know what I mean? Like, 
Just by, it's very easy to prioritize it when you prioritize it. <laughs> it's just like, why is our culture good? Because I care for it to be good. And my man, you, you may know this, like this industry does not do a good job of getting black and brown people into the industry. And so, you know, this residency program was, was very much knowing that I'm just taking anybody. You didn't have to go to Miami ad school. You guys all know. People coming from all over the different angles. You all know. And so, um, you know, it's impor- I just think it's important. And, it, and listen, it's a challenge, on, especially on the upper levels because there are so few leaders in the industry. It's like, I, gotta, I feel like I have to build it from scratch, you know? And that's why this shit matters. Thank you so much. I feel really welcome, Vayner. I've never worked anywhere like her before. So I, I see your effort and I appreciate it so much. Thank you, my And man. I have a second question that's unrelated to DI. Uh, if something catastrophic to happen and social media and internet disappear tomorrow, how would you adapt to the new normal? Well, if the internet and social media disappeared off the face of the earth, selling shit in advertising would be the last fucking thing on my mind. Just to give you the preview, if that shit happens, there's gonna be straight anarchy. Like, <laughs> like it's gonna be crazy out there. Like, I'd first like go to my parents' house and dig up my gun that I buried back there because <laughs> shit's gonna get wild <laughs> if that happens. Uh, but if you're saying it from a different angle, this agency will only forever be focused on attention, not social media. When social media looks like television and print in the future, There'll be a day where we'll be at the forefront of VR while everyone's still trying to do social media and I'm gonna be the guy at 62 yelling at all of you saying, the fuck are you doing social media for? That shit's overpriced, it's whack. You gotta do this VR stuff and so I'm unemotional about the platforms. I could give a fuck about social media. I care about where human attention is and that's what we live on. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you, Brandon. Hi, Gary. Um... First of all, very, very excited to finally meet you, uh, e-meet you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for, uh, you know, first of all, like having the residency program. Very, very grateful for the opportunity. I'm Tanvi Roela. I'm a media resident uh, at Comcast. I have two questions. Uh, just one question is a very generic question. I wanted to know, uh, in general, how, how do you deal with fear and like comparison in general on your day-to-day basis? How do you stay authentic in that sense? First, by not deploying it on anybody around me. So I think one of the most terrible things about fear is that it's the greatest virus of our time. It is human's greatest virus. That when people take on fear, they immediately try to deploy it on someone else to feel better. And so one of the things I'm most proud of is one of my greatest strengths, but also when it goes too far, one of my great vulnerabilities is I take on my fear and I don't express it out. What I tend to do, I, it's very rare for me to get to the stage that I'm gonna tell you, but occasionally when I'm at the highest point of fear or concern that I can get to, I tend to just go home and just like sit within myself and almost like, if I was like a superhero, I would like go into like a ball and it's almost like, you know how like snakes shed their skin? I shed my fear by deploying gratitude to myself in almost like a meditation state. And I've only done that two or three times. Every other time I'm just doing it naturally as I'm moving. As the fear or anxiety comes in, I'm in parallel pounding myself to shed it. And usually that works for me, it never tips over. So that's how I deal with it. I, I don't think most people are like me. I think most people, deal with fear by talking to their safest person, their mom, their husband, their best friend. I think that's nice, but what I'm very happy about is that we finally destigmatized therapy. I think the right way to deal with fear is to talk to somebody who isn't your friend or family to get it out because when you get fear out of your mouth, you feel better. And that's what I think people should do. Awesome. And just one last follow-up question is, I know your philosophy emphasizes a lot on the importance of hustle, you know, hard work and perseverance in achieving success. However, in the world like where burnout and mental health issues are increasingly very like important, how do you balance and like drive for achievement with knowing that there's a need for self-care and like well-being? What advice would you give to the ones who are struggling to find this balance? There is no correlation of hard work to 
true mental health issues. I think it's been a band-aid conversation. Hard work is remarkably enjoyable when you like what you're doing, and it's not when you don't. I think the world in the last 15 years has gotten this thing wrong. From the day I started talking about hustle or hard work, it always was connected directly to having a passion for it. People separated it and tried to weaponize it. And we've, a lot of people have demonized work ethic and hard work without the understanding of the enjoyment. For example, I demonize hard work in the gym. I do not want to do it. Thus I would make fun of it or not like it. And so for me, the thought of working so hard that I would be upset is literally the reverse of how I see it. I see it as I work so hard because I enjoy it. It's my game. I got, I got into all of those hours because I didn't want to stop doing it. Like playing a video game or like reading a book. And so I think the world is very confused. Mental health issues have gotten, is a very complex issue. It's a word that's thrown around today. First of all, thank God we have it because there are many people with it. But I don't think anyone's confused. It's also been so loosely used that people today use, I have a mental health issue for something that people 25 years ago said, I'm a little inconvenienced today. That's an extreme change of behavior. And so how do I balance it? By knowing there's no correlation to it. People putting pressure on themselves because they're insecure is leading to it. Not like if someone's insecure, they may think that I have to work 12 hours a day to make a million dollars because that million dollars is gonna show them that I'm good. That's not work ethic, that's insecurity. Our issues in the world right now are insecurity and entitlement. You're talking to a DNF student. You know how much I worked in high school? Zero. Do you wanna hear something insane? You guys are all pretty young, so this might still be quite easy to remember. I'm gonna say something nice and slow. I need you all to hear this. This is not a hyperbole. This is not a lie. This is not a joke. I did zero pieces of homework in my entire four years of high school. I read zero pages of a book in my four years of high school. So I don't think you should work hard if you don't like it. I think the world's got this super reversed and it confused all of you. It confused everyone. Don't burn yourself out. Don't even do it. <laughs> what do you, people, people are looking at the cause, not the root. We created entitlement, which created insecurity. We are a global power, the world is, unbelievably ridiculous. Do you understand that if you're on this Zoom right now, how luxurious your life is? But you're gonna focus on it not, because you're gonna see a TikTok that says, Gen Z can't be as successful. People are fucking, as their parent, like, they are pushing bullshit on you. That's quite a thought. Thank you so much, Gary. You're welcome. Pass it to Jimmy. It's, it really, you know, just to finish the thought, it's really fucked up. Like the thought that you work yourself into, it's, work is a byproduct of what's actually inside of you. It's not the fucking root. There's only two people that work super hard. The people that fully love it and they'd rather do it. I'd, I, I was in the office till 10.30 at night last night because it's more fun for me than going skiing or doing karaoke. And then there's the reverse. The people that are so fearful and so insecure they think just like getting straight A's in school by working 12 hours, it's gonna fix it. They don't know themselves. And what's really sad is it's convinced a lot of people that don't try. That's real fucked up. This, our prosperous society of the last 30 years has taught people indifference. And indifference leads to depression. If it doesn't matter, the fuck are you doing? All of it matters. Everything matters. Fucking eighth place trophies. <laughs> I'm gonna be historically right as fuck about eighth place trophies. Just putting it on the record. We'll be heralded when I'm dead. All right. Go ahead, Jimmy. 
Hey Gary, my name is Jimmy. I'm a media resident. I was on the Echo Park team, but now I'm the Pearson team. Yes, sir. And my question is a rather specific one regarding your ventures with Resi, actually. Okay. So you graduated college in 1998, the same year Open Table was released, and then you created Resi 16 years later. And my question is, why or how do you think you won the New York City dinner reservation game? Because like from what I've heard is that like people prefer Resi due to technology use and the fees, but like there have also been like some people saying that's because on open table the reviews are rather public, whereas on Resi it's private. But I guess I just want to ask like why do you think you won the New York City reservation game? The day we invented Resi, me and Ben Leventhal, we were having dinner on the Upper East Side and the first initial concept of Resi was to sell premium seats and impossible to get restaurants for a premium, just like first class seats on an airplane. We did it for about a year, a year and a half and we realized we didn't have the right idea. That it was fine, but it wasn't a big business. We also realized, and you asked such a great question, brother. What we realized, Jimmy, was Open Table was getting old, both in its software and in the kind of restaurants that were hot, were kind of like, it was almost like, it was kind of like social networks, right? Like the hottest restaurants in New York were like, eh, open table's lame. Let's just do, they were, they were looking for a different solution. So we had an epiphany in a boardroom that were like, fuck it, let's just make the best SaaS product for, let's make a much better product than open table and let's go hustle our asses off. And we, I'll never forget, I said to Ben Leventhal, who's the CEO, I said, Ben, because I really had the aha. I said, Ben, because he was in the restaurant scene for 20 years, he had a lot of relationships. I said, Ben, if we get 100 of the next 200 best restaurants in New York City on Resi, it's over. And that's literally what happened. We just had the best places. We had the best supply. Yeah, that's what like, um, because like currently I'm working on building an app similar to Resi, but in the nightlife industry space and that's what we're relying on, like getting the best venues downtown. To That's right. Your life. <laughs> Once you get that, now the problem is two way marketplaces are hard. So you get the best places, but if you have no fucking people, then it doesn't fuck, you got it? So you have to make yeah. sure you're creating demand as well. Yeah, we're going to get like a lot of users on it. <laughs> Good for you. Good luck. <laughs> Next up is Haley. Hey Gary, thanks for talking to us. I'll try to make this brief so other people can go, but I was kind of, my question I thought of in the beginning, my hand has been raised for a while, but what we were just talking about finding that thing that really drives you, I really relate to, and I just graduated college in May, and I've been dealing with this like existential crisis <laughs> of not being able to find what that is, and I think Vayner's, I'm really lucky to work for a company like Vayner because I feel like they really foster wanting you to succeed and wanting you to kind of find your niche, whatever that is. Um, so I kind of would love for you, what advice you would give someone or how to best go about finding that passion. And I think that for me, it's not about a timeline. It's just like eventually finding it. Um, so how do you think is the best way to go about that? And how Vayner can kind of, I could use Vayner to my advantage in finding that, what that might be. So Vayner is a place that's willing for you to like switch from media to like client, from client to analytics, so it's huge. So doing things for, you know, you can't be like too squeaky about it. Like if you decide to go into project management, do that for a year, then you can maybe talk about like six months later, so you're in it for 18 months. To your point, like if you discover it by the time you're 35, you're gonna win. So that's like real, and like I know that's like crazy because when you're 22, 35 seems like a thousand. So if you keep that in mind, and you use Vayner in two ways, being able to move if you feel like you haven't found it, and by being social and like doing things, like you should be signing up for classes. Like you need to like, people are like, I can't find what food I like. I'm like, go eat food. <laughs> like if you were to ask me like, how do I know Gary what my favorite food is? It's I'm like, Haley, by eating shit. Like you've gotta go eat oysters and sweetbreads and uni and tacos and banana. Like you have to eat shit, right? Same with this. Like you should be spending, like people who really dwell or are concerned or on the flip side are passionate and excited about finding their thing. Well, you've gotta find it. So like cool, you have your day job at Vayner but then join every club, everything that's here, the softball team, the this, and then like push yourself, like go do a ballroom dancing class, right? 
take a course on Coursera for like accounting. Like, like unless you're tasting, you don't know. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. And I feel very lucky that Vayner kind of fosters that culture because I know a lot of other companies don't do that. So I feel like, yeah, just taking advantage of what I have at my fingertips is probably the best way to go about it. Appreciate it. Jay Yang, we sold Resi to Amex four years ago, so I have no priority leverage. Sorry about that. Let me sneak one, Um, one, I only got time for one more. Let's get one in real quick. Yep, let's go, Gracie. All right, so I was just thinking, you know, we have a lot of pushback from clients sometimes here at Vayner. We talk about it a lot. And, you know, being personally in the spotlight as Gary Vee, I know it's probably a way different experience. So how do you handle rejection on a personal basis? I know that you said, like, giving no fucks, like, not giving a fuck is the key to do it all. But how do you really go into having that mindset? Like, how do you build that? By knowing I don't have control. Yeah. Right, Gracie? Like, I'm not the client on Pepsi or I'm not the viewer of my video or like, it's all based on humility. This is so fun for me to say. I wish there was a god of humility and she sat down right now and showed all of our scores. I'll bet my life that I'm the most humble person in here. But nobody would think that. They would think the reverse. I think people do not understand how much lack of humility is running through their body. As if, as if, you should be taken seriously. I love when people are like, yo, I should be taken serious. I'm like, why? I had somebody come in pretty hot from the creative team, was like, my ideas are not being taken serious. I'm like, okay. I was like, are you on social? They're like, yeah. I'm like, show me. They showed me all their social. I'm like, I would never take you serious. You're horrible at content. Not because of my opinion, because none of your shit does anything. We lack humility. The, the reason I can deal with it, Gracie, is because I don't think I'm special. Even as Gary V now, the way my brain thinks about it is like, cool, that's what I've done every day before today. Right. But today my idea or my thing might be bad. You know? Mm-hmm. The ability to deal with rejection is completely predicated on your relationship with your own humility. You'll love this one, I'll end it on this. Yes. I don't give a shit about other people's opinions, but I also don't think my shit's right. I like that. Yeah, and I think the biggest thing I would tell you is, I can tell you for sure, many of you are incredibly over audacious without having done anything yet. And I say that not as a raz, I say that to liberate you and make you happier. You know, it's a good thing. Very good thing, yeah. You know what I mean? It's a good thing. Like, please have unlimited conviction. I hope one of you have my job in this company one day. I literally pray to God that I'm looking at the future CEO of VaynerX. But, you know, you gotta get there first. Gotta go. See ya. Thank you so much. Bye, love you all. Thank you. I agree, those double questions fucked you all up. You deal with it with each other. You guys deal with it with each other.